Hey guys, it's Johannes here with the exam revolution team and in this meteorology video we're going to look at altimetry. So what we're going to cover in this video is going to be the operation of the altimeter, Q codes, the errors of the altimeter, then we'll look at pressure altitude calculations and density altitude calculations. So we've got quite a bit of things to get through so let's get started. So let's look at the operation of the altimeter. So how does it work? That's the big question. So the altimeter measures the ambient or the outside pressure and then displays an altitude to us using that pressure measurement. Hundreds, thousands, and then 10,000 are displayed with needles on the altimeter. So that's what the altimeter does. It basically just measures the outside pressure, and according to that pressure, it is calibrated to show us a specific altitude. So if I have to show you a picture of the altimeter, I'm pretty sure you know what that looks like, but that's basically all the, the altimeter. So let's just have a look at a few things on the altimeter. The first one there is what we call our subscale knob which is used to adjust the pressure setting on the altimeter subscale. Where's the subscale? There's the one subscale on the left hand side. And that's the subscale that is calibrated in meg hectopascals or millibars. Okay, it's the same thing. It's just different terminologies, right? And you can see that's typically what we use in South Africa is hectopascals. That's what they use in Europe as well and in most places in the world. However, you also get the other side of the coin, which is what we call our inches of mercury subscale. That's typically what they use in the US. And these two are obviously interlinked. So as you turn the subscale knob and you change the hectopascals, automatically the inches of mercury subscale will also change. And they are calibrated correctly as well. So whenever you fly with an altimeter that's got both subscales, it means that you can fly in any country, right? Because in America, for instance, They'll give you your pressure setting in inches mercury and then you need to be able to set it on the altimeter and then in some other countries they'll give you the hectopascals and then you can set that as well. So it's always great to have both sides of the coin. However, most altimeters just have the hectopascal subscale. Then the needles uh, that indicates the different altitudes to us, the long one indicates our hundreds of feet. So 100, 200, 300 and so on and so forth. The shorter guy indicates our thousands of feet, so that'll be 1,000, 2,000, 3,000. And then that one with a triangle actually indicates tens of thousands of feet. And that's basically what the altimeter shows us. Hundreds of feet, thousands of feet, and then ten thousands of feet. So let's look at how this works. So the altimeter is equipped with a capsule inside the instrument which can expand and contract as the pressure increases or decreases. This capsule is connected to the needles on the instrument and as the capsule expands or contracts when pressure changes, then the needles are moved, right? So there's just a linkage system between the needles and the capsule, and the capsule moves as the pressure changes. So here's a picture of a cross-section of the altimeter. Don't worry about the writing on the right-hand side, those uh, text things there. Just focus on the left-hand side for me, they're on the static board. So the altimeter obviously needs a static board. So every acre of this garden altimeter has a static board, and that is the little port that measures outside air pressure or we call it ambient pressure. So the altimeter measures ambient pressure using the static port of the aircraft. And then that static pressure is then fed into that aneroid there. So a sealed capsule with a vacuum inside, that's what that is. And when the pressure decreases, the capsule expands and vice versa. So you can see that the static port runs into the altimeter, but it doesn't run into that capsule, right? The pressure will just surround that capsule. So in other words, the higher the pressure becomes, so the lower the aircraft is, the more that capsule will contract as the pressure is obviously pushing it. And then as we go higher, this pressure that goes through the static port inside the altimeter will then become less and therefore that capsule over there will expand. All right, so that's basically how the aneroid capsule works. Then that capsule is then linked to the gears, right? So when the capsule expands or contracts, these gears are moved over there and they obviously then in turn move the needles. So you can see needles are connected to the gears, the gears connected to the aneroid capsule and the aneroid capsule is basically expanding and contracting according to what is happening around it in terms of pressure. And the pressure is fed through the static board. That's why it's so important to make sure before you fly that the static board is not covered with paint or you know, um, insects and things like that that makes nests there because you want that thing to work otherwise you have no altimeter indication. Then the setting to make sure the altimeter reads from the correct pressure setting we use the subscale knob to get a specific setting that we use during flight. And these settings have specific codes called Q codes. 
So let me just show you that. So there's our airplane, there's our altimeter. Just forget about the reading on the altimeter, just uh, don't worry about that for now. You can see this airplane is standing on a pressure line of a thousand hectopascals, right? So let's just imagine for theoretical purposes that the pressure where this airplane is standing on the ground is a thousand hectopascals. So what do we do? If we take our subscale, we turn the knob and we put a thousand hectopascals in the subscale. What is the altimeter going to do? It is going to read our height above this 1000 hectopascal line. Because essentially what we're doing is if we put a figure into the subscale of the altimeter, we are telling it, read my height above this pressure line. So essentially you're setting the reference for the altimeter. That's what you're doing when you give it a pressure setting in the subscale. Now, the altimeter in this case will obviously indicate zero feet as you're on the pressure level that you have set on the subscale. So we've said to this altimeter, read my height above the 1000 hectopascal line but we are on this hectopascal on this 1000 hectopascal line so obviously that means the altimeter is going to read zero feet right because we're right on it however if we look further down let's go down a notch and say now we have a pressure line of 1010 hectopascals if we now set the altimeter subscale to 1010 hectopascals it's going to read our height above the 1010 hectopascal line Okay, now we know that there's where we are, it's a thousand hectopascals and what is below us, what we've set on the altimeter is a thousand and ten hectopascals. So clearly there's a ten hectopascal difference between where we are and what we've set on the altimeter. And in terms of feet, that would be 270 feet because remember in every, on average one hectopascal equals 27 feet. So ten hectopascals would be 270 feet. So essentially what we've done here, once again, we've said to the altimeter, read my height above the 1010 hectopascal line. And you can see we're 270 feet above it. So therefore, the altimeter will read 270 feet. So the altimeter will indicate 270 feet as you are 270 feet above the pressure level that you have set on the subscale. And you can see that we can go and calculate this because if we know what the pressure is where we are, and we know what the pressure is that we've set on the altimeter, we can get the difference in pressures times that by 27, and that is what the altimeter will indicate. So we can always calculate it. Then let's take it a notch further. Let's now say we set the altimeter to a new pressure line of 1025 hectopascals. Right, so now we take the subscale and we say to the altimeter, okay, show me how high am I above the 1025 hectopascal pressure line. So now it will indicate that to you. Obviously, the difference between where we are at 1,000 hectopascals and what we've set on the altimeter, that's 25 hectopascals times that by 27, and that's going to give you 675 feet. So what will happen? The altimeter will indicate 675 feet as you're 675 feet above the pressure level that you've set on the subscale. And guys, that's really how easy the altimeter is to operate. That's really how it works. You just give it a reference, and it will tell you how high or low are you above that reference. Now we can also take it the other way around. So if you have a pressure level that is above you, let's say 980 hectopascals, like in this example, if we set that on the subscale, well now this pressure line is above us, so we are below it, right? So the altimeter knows that we're below it, and we are 20 hectopascals below it, because we're at 1000 hectopascals, and we've set the altimeter to 980, so there's a 20 hectopascal difference, times that by 27, and that, that will give us 540 feet. So what will the altimeter do now? It'll indicate minus 540 feet as you are 540 feet below the pressure level that you have set on the subscale. Okay, so it'll indicate in the minuses. So that's really how the altimeter works in terms of pressure settings on the subscale. And as we go through the rest of the training in this video, you'll get to know how to use these different pressure settings. And that's why Q codes are so important. So let's have a look at what is a Q code. Q codes were actually developed in the 1900s by the British government to make it easy for their ships to communicate to other foreign ships that don't speak English very fluently. So you get a lot of Q codes, the ones that we're going to focus on, I'll show you just now. But Q codes were basically just developed to make it easy for people of different nationalities and different accents to be able to communicate. Because if you have one code and everybody knows what that code means, then it's easy to communicate. And that's why we have these Q codes. So how do we use it? In aviation, we use Q codes to describe certain pressures, headings, tracks, and also just in general information that is necessary to make decisions as a pilot. So between ATC and pilots, 
you typically hear them talking about cue codes between pilots you'll hear them talking about cue codes between flight instructors and students you'll hear them talk about cue codes and you'll probably you know deal a lot with cue codes still going forward in your training so there are a lot of cue codes and each cue code means something which can be understood throughout the world no matter your language so let me give you a good example of this so can you imagine Try, let's imagine you're flying, right? And there's someone else in the air as well. And you're in a very strange country, foreign country. Can you imagine trying to ask that other pilot who can barely speak English, what is your barometric set, pressure setting on your altimeter? The guy's probably going to crash because he, he doesn't know what you're saying, right? And that's why we rather than just ask, what q &H are you on? When he hears the word q &H, he knows immediately what you're talking about. What is the pressure setting that you've got on your altimeter? So it's so much easier than trying to use English language. They just give Q codes for everything. And right throughout the world, everybody knows what these Q codes mean. So obviously you, you need to know as well. So the Q codes that we will look at is QFE, QNH, QFF, and QNE. I'll tell you which one is which and how each of these work just now. So let's start with the first one, QFE. So QFE is the pressure at field elevation. Hence the FE in QFE, the FE stands for field elevation. So QFE is the pressure at the aerodrome elevation, so at the airport itself. So this is the actual pressure when you're on the ground at the airfield and it's measured with a barometer. So most airfields that's got ATC and that can give you Q and H settings and pressure settings, they have a barometer which measures the air pressure and so therefore they can measure what the air pressure is at the aerodrome and that is called our QFE, pressure at field elevation. So if we have QFE on the altimeter, if we set that on the altimeter subscale, then the altimeter will reference the airfield pressure and will therefore show us our height above the aerodrome. Remember whatever pressure setting you put into the altimeter subscale, that is the reference that the altimeter is working from. So if you put the pressure that is at aerodrome level, then the altimeter is going to constantly tell you how high are you above that aerodrome pressure. So essentially, how high are you above the aerodrome? Okay. Then an example of this, if the QFE, so the pressure at the aerodrome, is 1,000 hectopascals, and this is set on the subscale of the altimeter, the altimeter will read our height above this 1,000 hectopascal pressure line, which is the aerodrome. So there we are. We're standing on the ground there. It can be the runway or the apron, doesn't matter. There's a thousand hectopascals, that um, green dotted line over there. You can see the pressure at the aerodrome is a thousand hectopascals. That's what we call our QFE. And in this case, guys, if you set a thousand hectopascals on your altimeter, the altimeter will read zero feet because you're on that line. So we never really fly with the QFE set unless we specifically want to know what is our height above the aerodrome. So this is a setting that we don't really use when we fly every day it's really something that we just use to see how high are we above the aerodrome i think they actually use it quite often in the military um, for their exercises then if you take off so if you were you know now to take off and fly then obviously the altimeter will still read your height above the aerodrome but now the altimeter is going to read higher because you're not on the ground anymore right so as you take off and you start climbing that reading that you see on the altimeter two three four five six seven hundred foot that is your height above the aerodrome an example of a question in the exam, if an altimeter reads zero when on the ground at an airfield, which datum is set on the altimeter subscale? And then we'll give you a few options and that's obviously your QFE because that is pressure at aerodrome elevation. So if you set that, the altimeter will read zero when you're on the ground. Then when QFE is set on the subscale of an aircraft altimeter on the ground at an aerodrome, it will read and then the answer is zero. Okay. So I'll give you a few options, 500 foot, 200 foot, or you know some other answers, but the answer is just zero. If it's QFE set on the subscale and it's at the aerodrome, it'll read zero. Unless you've got a very high aeroplane, which is 20 or 30 feet high in the air, then the altimeter will obviously read that, right? And that actually happens, but that's not something for this video. Then if we look at the next um, Q code that we get, it's called Q and H. So Q and H is the pressure at field elevation, so our QFE, reduced to mean sea level. In other words, they take the QFE and then adjust that pressure according to ISA to get the pressure at sea level. So QNH is actually our pressure at sea level, but they use the QFE to calculate the pressure at sea level. So how does that work? So there's our little 172 again. 
and it's standing on that 1000 hectopascal line uh, with our you know QFE set over there and the altimeter we know will read zero okay now let's imagine sea level is 270 feet below us in other words they can say that the elevation of the aerodrome is 270 feet so we're 270 feet above sea level and that's something that we know we know the elevation for all the aerodromes because they can actually measure that right so we know for a fact that we're 270 feet above sea level and the pressure at the aerodrome is a thousand hectopascals so now it's easy now they take 270 feet they divide that by 27 because one hectopascal is 27 feet and then they get 10 hectopascals so that means from our aerodrome to sea level is going to be a thousand plus 10 because it is a thousand hectopascals at aerodrome plus 10 that gives us a thousand ten hectopascals q and h and that's really how they calculate it now you don't have guys sitting there doing these calculations every day they've actually got systems installed that can do these things automatically but that is what q and h is it is a calculated pressure at sea they don't have a barometer at sea level that measures the air pressure they calculate it using the ISA rule of one hectopascal is 27 feet. So they really just measure the pressure at the aerodrome and then reduce that to sea level. QNH on the altimeter. If we set the QNH on the altimeter subscale, the altimeter will reference the sea level pressure and will therefore show us our height above the sea. And this is called altitude. And this is the one that we fly with mostly is QNH, right? We'll see there's another one that we use flight levels which is q and e but q and h is the one that we use mostly and this this is probably typically what you're going to use for your flight training always the q and h so an example of this if q and h so the pressure at sea level that they have calculated is 1010 hectopascals and this is set on the subscale the altimeter will read our height above this 1010 hectopascal pressure line which is then our height above sea level and that is called altitude so there we are on the ground the altimeter will read 270 feet right you can see if we set 1010 hectopascals on the altimeter so we tell the altimeter to reference that blue dotted line at the bottom of the screen which is sea level the 1010 hectopascal line so with 1010 set on the altimeter it will read 270 feet because that's how high we are above the blue dotted line obviously in the air as we start climbing altitude will start to increase but still the altimeter is going to reference sea level as our reference so in other words it will continue to tell us how high are we now above sea level so we mostly fly with q and h set in and around the aerodrome and therefore all aircraft reports their altitude and everyone references the same pressure at sea level so we all reference q and h right so typically you'll hear if you operate from an aerodrome they will give you the q and h if there's an atc and then everybody's flying with the subscale on that q and h setting so that everybody references the same pressure level otherwise we might have chaos then an example of a question landing at johannesburg international where the elevation is 5500 feet you're given a qfe of 840 hectopascals the q and h is so they give you the pressure at the aerodrome and then they ask for what is the pressure at sea but they do tell us how high we are above sea. They say it's 5,500 feet. So now it's easy. You know what the pressure is at the aerodrome. You know how high we are above sea. So now you just reduce it to sea level. And the answer to this is 1023 hectopascals. Let me show you how we get it. So guys, I always want you to draw a picture like this. Never, ever, ever try and do questions like this without drawing pictures. If you're going to be lazy and you're not going to draw these pictures, you're going to get these questions wrong. And there are probably three or four marks in the exam. And then you're going to kick yourself afterwards. I've seen this many times. I've seen many tears because of this. Please just draw a picture. Okay, and it's very simple. You just draw a little Z like that with the airport or the aircraft at the top there where the aerodrome is. And at the bottom, you always have your sea level where I've put the XXX. Okay, so what information did we get in the uh, question? We know that the QFE, the pressure at aerodrome, is 840 hectopascals. And we know that our altitude or our elevation above sea is 5,500 foot. And they asked us to calculate the Q and H. In other words, what is the calculated pressure at sea level? So we need to get a figure for that XXXXX over there. Okay, so what do we do? We go and we say 5,500 foot divided by 30 hectopascals. Now you might be asking, well, I've just said 27 foot is one hectopascal. You can round it up. 
sometimes you're going to have to round it up to 30 feet other times you can use 27 feet you will get a feeling for what the answers are like okay so i'll show you both the options just now in the next question where we use 27 feet and 30 feet and then you'll see the difference in the answer options but you will see if you use 27 feet and you're far off by your calculation when you look at the answer options in the question then just go back and use 30 feet and then you should you should be within one hectopascal at all times guys if you're not within one hectopascal then if you've used 27 feet go and use 30 feet and then you should be within one hectopascal there should be no reason why you cannot be within one so 5500 in this case divided by 30 gives you 183 hectopascals in other words if we come down from where that aircraft is to sea level the pressure must increase by 183 hectopascals okay so that means pressure at aerodrome is 840 add the 183 to that and we get 1023 hectopascals so that means our QNH must be 1023 hectopascals like we've seen in the answer now if you use 27 feet in this calculation you'll see that you get 1044 hectopascals as QNH which is wrong so therefore we know we need to use 30 feet so you can go and do that same calculation now, draw the same picture, but use 27 feet in that calculation. And then you'll see you'll get the Q and H is 1044. And that there wasn't any answer option. I mean, that's like a, what is that? A 21 hectopascal difference. So therefore we just use 30 feet and then that'll bring us a lot closer to the exact answer, which is 1023. So that's how you know. So I would suggest you start with using 27 feet. If you're far off, then use 30 feet. Another question. The QNH at an airfield with an elevation of 360 feet is 1015. What is the QFE? And then you can see in this question they actually said use 30 feet as 1 hectopascal. Okay. Now in this case, don't get confused. They're saying the QNH at an airfield. It doesn't mean that the pressure at the airfield is 1015 hectopascals. It just means that the pressure at sea level measured from that airfield is 1015. So don't get confused between that. Now they're asking what is the QFE. So we need to calculate what is the pressure at the aerodrome. So QNH is always the pressure at C. Answer to this, 1003, 1003 hectopascal. So let me show you how to do that. Same story as always, guys. Draw the little Z, draw the little picture that I'm telling you to draw. We don't know what the pressure is at the aerodrome, XXX over there. We know what the QNH is. That's our pressure at sea level. It's 1015. What other information do we have? We know we are 360 feet above sea level. Okay, so we've got that. Then we take 360. They said in the question, use 30 feet for one hectopascal. So we go 360 divided by 30, and that gives us 12 hectopascals. Now be careful. The aerodrome is above sea level. So you don't increase the pressure. You must decrease the pressure. So then we go 1015 minus the 12 hectopascals. And that gives us 1033, uh, sorry, 1003 hectopascals. So our QFE, our pressure at aerodrome, is 1003 hectopascals. So please don't make the mistake of adding the pressure when you should be subtracting it and also the other way around. So if you work from the airfield down to sea level, you should be adding the pressure. Don't make that mistake because I promise you they're going to have that as an answer option and you're going to pick it if you've done it incorrectly. That was... Q and H, right? And QFE. Then we get what we call QFF. So what is this? This is the actual pressure at sea level. So in other words, you're going to put a barometer there and they can measure what the pressure is at sea. Okay, that's QFF. Now the difference between this and the Q and H is that the Q and H is derived from our QFE, like you've just seen. It's a calculation that we do using 30 feet per 1 hectopascal or 27 feet per 1 hectopascal. So we're using the ISA formula for, for calculating the QNH, and that's 1 hectopascal is 27 feet, or rounded up to 30. But QFF is the actual pressure at C, and it's not derived from the QFE using ISA. So if we put QFF on the altimeter, well, we never really use the QFF on the altimeter, as we cannot have barometers all along the coastline to give us the exact pressure setting at C. That's why we use QNH. So they just measure the pressure at the aerodrome, reduce that to sea level, and then that's the Q and H that we operate from at that aerodrome. We can't have barometers all along the coastline giving us pressures. Then if we need to do a comparison, Q and H and QFF will be the same. So the actual pressure at sea level versus the 
calculated pressure at sea level, which is QNH, will be the same under ISAC conditions. So when it is ISAC, 15 degrees Celsius outside, temperature lapse rate of 2 degrees Celsius, air is dry and uniform, that whole story, right? But it will differ if conditions are not standard. So anything that's not ISA will cause the QNH and the QFF to differ. And so it's important to understand how QFF changes compared to the QNH in non-standard conditions. So let's quickly have a look at that. So there we have three blocks of air, right? Let's look at the middle one first. Here you can see there are eight molecules in that block of air, the round blue circles. And that's an ISA block of air. So we assume that that block of air conforms to the ISA condition. So you can see those eight molecules weigh one hectopascal at the bottom of the block. And those eight molecules are spread vertically over a distance of 27 feet. And that's what ISA says, right? ISA says that one hectopascal is equal to 27 feet. Okay, so let's just use that as our reference. If we go to the left hand side, now the air is colder than ISA. Okay, what happens? We know that colder air contracts. It's more dense. The air molecules move closer to each other. So there are still eight air molecules in that block because they're not closer to each other. So they still weigh one hectopascal of pressure. However, you can clearly see that they're not so far spaced from each other, right? So instead of being 27 feet vertically, the block of air is now only 20 feet vertically high, okay? So in other words, one hectopascal of air is now equal to 20 feet instead of one hectopascal of air that is equal to 27 feet. So when the temperature is colder than ISA, the block of air will be condensed and it will be contracted. So therefore, it will be less than 27 feet. And 20 feet is just an example, guys. Anything less than 27 feet would be good. Obviously, the colder it becomes, the smaller that block becomes. Then on the right-hand side of ISA, we've got our eight molecules again. However, because the air is warmer than ISA, they obviously expand. So they're further away from each other, meaning that although there are still eight molecules, they all weigh one hectopascal. So you can see all the pressures are the same. But look at the vertical extent of that block. It's now 35 feet as an example. Anything more than 27 feet would be good. But any temperature warmer than ISA would mean that our air is vertically more than 27 feet high. That is an important concept to understand. So now let's have a look at, remember we're now going to make a comparison between QNH and QFF. So let's look what happens when the conditions are ISA temperature. So when it is actually ISA temperatures outside. So there's our airport. We're a thousand feet above sea level. Our QFE, as an example, let's just say the pressure at aerodrome is 1000 hectopascals. Okay. So now if we take ISA conditions, we know that one block of air that equals one hectopascal is 27 feet high. So we know we are a thousand feet above sea level. So if we go a thousand feet divided by 27 feet, then we get 37 hectopascals. So a thousand hectopascals, which is our aerodrome pressure, plus the 37 hectopascals gives us 1037 hectopascals. So that is the Q and H. Remember, we've calculated this. So therefore, it's 1037 hectopascals as a Q and H. This was in ISO conditions, right? Now, because of ISO conditions, the actual pressure at sea, if you were to take a barometer and you're going to hold it there at sea level, it'll probably also measure the pressure at sea as 1037 hectopascals. Why? Because it is ISA conditions. So the QNH of 1037 was calculated with the assumption that one hectopascal is 27 feet. So on a standard ISA day, your QNH and your QFF will be the same. Okay, that's important to understand. Now, but conditions are not always such that one hectopascal equals 27 feet. So let's see what happens to QFF on a colder than ISA day. That's why I've shown you those different air blocks, right? So that you can see how the one contracts and the other one expands. So exactly the same scenario now with our airfield and how high it is above sea. Only difference now is going to be that the temperatures outside is now colder than ISA. So conditions colder than ISA temperature, let's see. Once again, let's say our QFE, our pressure at aerodrome is 1000 hectopascals. You can see on the left hand side was our ISA blocks, right? They were all 27 feet. Now we have blocks that is colder than ISA. That's why I've put the little minuses in there. And let's just use an example and say these blocks of air, because they're colder, are now 15 feet vertically. Okay, so we can't use 27 feet in our calculation. We need to use 15 feet because the air is colder. So we're a thousand feet above 
sea level. So we go 1000 divided by 15 feet for one hectopascal. And that gives us 66.6 .6 hectopascals. Then we go 1000 plus the 66, so our aerodrome pressure plus the 66 by the amount, 66.6 .6 is the amount by which it will increase down to sea level. And that gives us 1066.6 .6 hectopascals. So in other words, what have we calculated? Our QFF, right, on a colder than ISA day will be 1066.6 .6 hectopascals, while we would have calculated our QNH as 1037 hectopascals. Remember, you're never going to change the 27 feet when you calculate the QNH, right? It stays as if you're using ISA conditions. Whether it's colder or hotter than ISA, doesn't matter. We always use 27 feet to calculate the QNH. So the QNH right throughout will always remain 1037. But why I've used the 15 feet as an example to calculate the QFF is to show you what happens in colder air than ISA to the actual pressure at sea level. So if you now take a barometer and you go and stand at sea level in this cold air, it's going to give you a reading of roughly 1066.6 .6 hectopascals. While the QNH that we've calculated is 1037 hectopascals. So you can see there's a massive difference. It's like 29 uh, 29 hectopascals difference there in the in the pressures, right? Just because it's so much colder than what ISA says it should be. So what is the moral of the story over here? You can see on a colder than ISA day, the QFF, the actual pressure at sea, is more than the QNH for an aerodrome above sea level. Remember that picture that we've drawn is for an aerodrome that was above sea level. So for an aerodrome that is below sea level, your QFF would be lower than QNH. So very easy to remember, if you understand what happens to an aerodrome above sea level when it's colder than ISA, if you can remember that the QFF is higher than QNH, whenever the aerodrome is below sea level, well, then it's easy. You just remember it's the opposite of that, so now it will be lower. Okay. Then if we have conditions warmer than ISA, that was colder, you could have seen QFF was higher than QNH for an aerodrome above sea. Now we take the same story. However, the conditions are just warmer. So outside air temperature is higher than ISA. So QFE is 1,000 hectopascals at the aerodrome. There's our ISA air, then our colder than ISA air, which, which was 15 feet. Now we have hotter than ISA air. So one block of one hectopascal air will now be, as an example, 35 feet vertically. So we take our 1,000 feet, divide that by 35 feet. That gives us 28.5 hectopascals. So we take 1,000 hectopascals plus the 28.5. That now gives us 1028.5 hectopascals. So... What is our QFF that we've just calculated? 1028.5. So in other words, if you were to stand at sea level on this day with a barometer, the pressure that it would measure at sea level would probably be 1028.5 hectopascals. But look what we've calculated as the QNH, 1037 hectopascals. So according to the QNH calculation, it's actually you know, a higher pressure at sea than what it actually is. And that is because the air is warmer than ISA. Okay. So QFF is lower than QNH on a warmer than ISA day. So you can see on a warmer than ISA day, QFF less than QNH for an aerodrome above sea level. Once again, for an aerodrome below sea level, your QFF would be higher than your QNH. So just the opposite. So guys, there's a little table for you for um, QNH and QFF conversions. Make sure that you understand this. I don't want you to go and study this table like a parrot, please. This is really just a reference so that you can, you know, see how easy it actually is to remember these things. But I want you to try and think of the pictures and the way that I've explained it to you using those pictures, because that's how you're going to understand it. Studying this table like a parrot is not going to get you through the exam and it's not going to help you understand this stuff properly. OK, so on the left hand side, you can see it's just the elevation of the aerodrome above sea level. Then if it was at sea level and then if it was below sea level, just out of interest sake, you can see if the aerodrome is at sea level, the middle table or the middle column, then you can see it doesn't matter what the pressure, uh, sorry, what the temperature is doing, your QNH and your QFF will always be the same. And it makes sense, right? Because your aerodrome is right at sea level. So it doesn't matter how the pressure or the temperature changes, the, the aerodrome is right there where the sea level is. So QNH and QFF will always be the same. The one that we've done is the first column that was for an aerodrome above sea level. And you can see once again, if you have ISA conditions, then your QNH and your QFF will be the same. What you've calculated and what the actual pressure at sea level is will be the same. And then one to the right of that, 
your outside air temperature less than ISA, you can see in the first column there for an aerodrome above sea level, your Q&H will be less than your QFF, or you can turn it around and say your QFF will be more than q and it doesn't matter. And then the last column, if your outside air temperature is higher than ISA, so it's a warmer than ISA day, then your Q&H will be more than your QFF, or QFF will be less than Q&H. So make sure that you just that you can work it both ways, right? Because sometimes they might ask you, is Q and H more than QFF, or they can throw it around and say, is QFF less than Q and H? And then you need to understand that it's actually the same thing. Okay, so use that table as a reference. Then Q and E, what is Q and E? So we've done Q and H, QFE, and QFF. The last one is Q and E. So Q and E is the ISA standard pressure setting of 1013.25 hectopascals. Or then, if you're working inches mercury, it's 29.92 inches of mercury. When do we use this? Q&E on the altimeter. So when we have Q&E set on the altimeter subscale, so we actually set 1013 on the subscale, hectopascals, then the altimeter will use 1013 as its reference, and then we call it our flight level. So when we put Q&E on the subscale, 1013, we're actually flying flight levels and not altitudes. Okay. Now we have transition zones for this because you can imagine you can't have one guy flying on Q and E and another one on Q and H. There needs to be rules obviously for when do you use which. So we have transition zones for this. So we have a transition zone that tells us when to change from Q and H to Q and E and vice versa. So in other words, from altitude to flight levels and from flight levels to altitudes. So the level to change from Q and H to Q and E, so that's from altitudes to flight levels, is called our transition altitude. And the level to change from Q and E to Q and H, which is from flight levels to altitudes, is called our transition level. So let me just show you that in a picture. So the transition altitude, that's the first one. This is a specified altitude through which we change from Q and H to Q and E during the climb. So this happens during the climb. So you take off using Q and H from the aerodrome, and then when you go through a specific altitude, you must change to flight levels, which is Q and E. And so we essentially go from flying altitudes to flying flight levels. Then the transition level is the opposite of that. That's in the descend. So when you've cruised, now you're coming into land, somewhere during the descend, you need to change from flight levels to altitudes. And so this is a specified level through which we change from Q and E to Q and H during the descent. We essentially go from flying flight levels to flying altitudes. So there we are. There's the aerodrome. You can see we in the descent there. The top red dotted line is our transition level. Guys, these are things that is mentioned in the regulations. So when we talk about air law and things like that, you'll get to know transition level and also in your radio, you know, your radio course, they'll show you all about transition levels. So I don't want to go too much into detail here, but that's the that's a specified level that you descend through. And they will you at that level you need to know that you must now change from flight levels, which is Q and E to your altitudes, which is Q and H. So there we are at transition level. So above the transition level, we always fly flight levels on 1013. Flying through it, what do we do? We're going into land now and we need to change from flight levels to altitudes. So transition level is used to change from Q and E to Q and H. Then if we take off okay, from the airport, we will have Q and H set on the altimeter. So we're flying altitudes. And as we take off through the climb, then with our Q and H set below the transition altitude, we will fly what we call altitudes. So we'll report, you know, our altitudes are not our flight levels. However, that is obviously referencing in this case, I've just given an example of the Q and H as 1020 hectopascal. So let's imagine the calculated pressure at C is 1020. So that's what we'll have set on the altimeter. So what happens now as we go through the transition altitude, we change from that 1020 hectopascals to our Q and E, which is 1013 hectopascals. And that's the transition altitude and transition level. Now let's have a look at the different errors that we get with the altimeter, because it's got quite a few and it can be quite dangerous. Now in non isa conditions, if the temperature and the pressure conditions are non-standard, so we have non isa conditions, it's either hotter or colder than what ISA says it should be then the altimeter has errors in its indications. Because remember, everything around the altimeter is based on ISA, okay? And that's why it's so important to understand these errors. So in altitudes in aviation, we talk about two altitudes. The one is called indicated altitude. That's what the altimeter is indicating to you. 
and then your true or your real altitude. That is how high you actually are above sea. So if I could take a tape measure from sea level to where your aeroplane is and I pull it up like that and I can go and measure you're at 10,000 feet, that would be your real altitude. We don't reference the indicated altitude for that. So indicated altitude is what the altimeter shows as your altitude, so inside the cockpit. But the true altitude is your actual altitude above the sea or above the land, depending on what you've set on the, alt on the altimeter or what you want to reference. In non-standard conditions, the indicated altitude and true altitude differs. So what the altimeter is showing you versus what I can go and measure with a tape measurer is going to be two different things. And that's where the danger comes because you're obviously trusting the altimeter. You don't know how high you are above ground. You can't look down and be like, mm, I'm at 9,500 foot. No, you trust the altimeter, but you need to know the errors of the altimeter. So here's an example of what happens. So let's say we're flying in a block of air, which has got ISAR conditions, right? Once again, same old story. There are eight molecules in there. And let's just say in this case, those eight molecules weigh 1000 hectopascals altogether. Okay. Now we've set the altimeter on a thousand hectopascals on its subscale. And the altimeter, the only thing that the altimeter does is it picks up, okay, I've got eight air molecules below me. And those eight air molecules gives me a thousand hectopascals pressure. And so I can tell you by using that, that we are at 10,000 feet. So the indicated altitude will be 10,000 feet. That's what the altimeter shows us. However, because it's ISA conditions, if I take the tape measurer and I can measure how high you are above the sea, then your true altitude will be 10,000 feet. I will get 10,000 feet on the tape measurer because it's ISA conditions. So what the altimeter is telling you is actually true. It's not lying because the conditions are such that it is ISA. Okay, so the altimeter is correct in this case. However, Let's go to um, an air mass which is colder than ISA. Now we know that in a colder than ISA air mass, what happens? The air is more dense, so the molecules contract. So look how close those eight molecules are now. But let's keep the pressure the same. It's a thousand hectopascals. So once again, guys, the altimeter only sees, oh, okay, below me, there are eight air molecules. It's weighing a thousand hectopascals. So what does it think? Well, I'm at 10,000 feet. That's the only thing that the altimeter knows. It doesn't know how high you are above ground or above sea. It just measures the pressure. So as long as the altimeter sees eight air molecules below it and that it weighs a thousand hectopascals, it's going to tell you we are at 10,000 feet. And that's what it does. Your indicated altitude is 10,000 feet because there's eight air molecules below you. However, if I now take the tape measurer and I go and measure from sea to where you are, it's probably going to give me something like 8,000 feet. Once again, just an example, it might be 9,500, might be 9,000. I've just used an example as 8,000. So your true altitude is 8,000 feet, but the altimeter is saying you're at 10,000 feet. That's a 2,000 feet difference. So can you imagine that if there was an 8,000 feet mountain ahead of you and your altimeter is showing you're at 10,000 feet, you will fly into the mountain because you're actually flying at 8,000 feet, although the altimeter is saying you're flying at 10,000 feet. So that is why it's so important to make sure that your terrain clearance is always huge. You don't want to clear a mountain by just a thousand or two thousand feet because this happens with the altimeter. So in colder than ISA air, okay, the altimeter is what we call over reading. Why is it over reading? Because it's showing we're at 10,000 feet, but we're actually at 8,000 feet. And as you can imagine, that is obviously very dangerous. Like I've just mentioned to you, you might fly into terrain. Okay. So remember that in colder than ISA air, the altimeter is overreading because the air is more dense. However, if we go to the other side of the spectrum with warmer than ISA air, we know now that these eight molecules of air are expanding, right? So once again, the altimeter doesn't care. It says, okay, I've got eight air molecules below me. You've set a thousand hectopascals on my subscale. I can pick up we're at 10,000 feet because I've got eight air molecules below me. That's all that it's looking for, just the pressure. So in other words, the altimeter once again, in this case, is going to show you, yep, we're at 10,000 feet. That's your indicated altitude. However, if I come with a tape measure and I can put it from sea level to where your airplane is flying in the air, I'm probably going to get something like 12,000 feet. That would be your true altitude. So where air is warmer than ISA, the altimeter is under reading. Now, obviously, this is not as dangerous as the other one where it is over reading, right? You would rather want the altimeter to underread. So here it's saying you're at 10,000 feet, but you're actually flying at 12,000 feet, which is fine. Okay, you'll clear the mountain. 
So, you can see it's quite dangerous, right? Now the altimeter has got two errors. Pressure error and then the temperature error. And I've actually combined them in those previous illustrations. I've quickly combined them. But let's take them each and see what happens. So let's take the pressure error first. This is when the indicated altitude and the true altitude differs due to non-standard pressure. So in other words, if the pressure at C is not 1013 hectopascals like Isa says it should be, then your altimeter has got an issue. It's not reading correctly. So let's have a look. So let's start with a block in the middle, the Isa pressure, right? We know by now that when we have Isa conditions, the altimeter is going to read correctly. 10,000 feet displayed on the altimeter will be 10,000 feet in true altitude terms. So there we are, it's correct. Then to the left, if it's colder than ISA, well, let's rather just say the pressure is higher than ISA. So sorry, I forgot to mention that, guys. Look in the middle, um, the picture in the middle. You can see at the bottom, it's 1013. That's our ISA pressure, okay? Then the one to the left, I've increased the pressure to 1025 hectopascals, and clearly you can see the air molecules are closer. Okay, so now we're in a high pressure area. What will happen? The altimeter is going to overread. Okay, the same as what it does with colder than ISA air. So in a high pressure scenario, the altimeter will overread. Dangerous. In a low pressure scenario, it's almost like we have warmer than ISA air. The altimeter will underread. Okay, and you can see the pressure that I've put down the right hand side is a thousand hectopascals. So why do we have this scenario? Well, remember, low pressure the air molecules expand. High pressure, the air molecules contract. And that's why we have this scenario over here. So please remember, high pressure, altimeter overreads. Standard pressure, it's correct. Low pressure, it's going to underread. So when you're flying, this is important, when you're flying from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure or vice versa, the true altitude will change. So if you decide you're going to fly from you know, point A to point B, and at point A you have a pressure of 1,030 hectopascals, and at point B you have a pressure of 1,000 hectopascals, there's a 30 hectopascal difference between point A and point B. So if you continue to fly from point A all the way to point B on your 1030 hectopascal setting, you might have issues. So let's see what happens. So there on the left-hand side we've got a standard pressure, 1013. Let's just use that as an example, okay? Our indicated altitude is at 10,000 feet, and that is our true altitude as well because it's eyes are conditions. So our true altitude equals indicated altitude. The blue line at the bottom, the horizontal line, is referencing our sea level. Okay. Now let's say we're flying to an area also at the coast, but there's a low pressure system there. That pressure over there where we're flying to our destination is only 1,000 hectopascals. So in other words, where will 1,013 hectopascals be? It will be below that sea level of 1,000 hectopascals, right? Because as we decrease altitude, the pressure will increase. So 1,013 will be far below that. Now, if we had to look at a sample of air at you know that point where we have 1,000 hectopascals pressure, you can see we have a block of air there, four air molecules in it. Obviously, less air molecules because it weighs less. But remember, we're flying with a pressure set of 1013, just for example purposes. So, our altimeter must reference that 1013 hectopascal as we're flying from the left-hand side to the right-hand side of the screen. So, we're going to use that 1013. So, there now we've got our eight air molecules over there, and that's what the altimeter is going to read. It wants that eight air molecules below it to show us our indicated altitude. So, what happens? There we are. We get to point B. The altimeter is showing, yep, we're at 10,000 feet. Why? Because it's referencing the 1013 line. We haven't changed our Q&H to 1,000 hectopascals yet. Okay. Now, obviously, you would want to do that, right? Then your indication would be correct. But what I'm trying to show you here is that if you're flying from a high to a low pressure and you're not changing your Q&H, what will actually happen with the aeroplane? So here it's showing that we're at 10,000 feet. But Jonas comes with a tape measure and he measures from sea level to where you are. And I say, nope, you're at 8,000 feet, right? Because that is your true altitude. That's really how high you are above sea. But look at what the altimeter says. It's saying you're at 10,000 feet because it's referencing that red dotted line at the bottom of the sea. And that's just because that's the pressure setting that you've given it, right? And that is the problem flying from a high to a low pressure because that's what your flight path looks like. So your true altitude in this case is less than your indicated altitude, which is a problem because if there was a mountain in between these two blocks of air, 
you would actually have descended into it because that is what your flight path looks like right so going from a high to a low pressure we have a saying high to low careful go because you're actually decreasing your true altitude so remember this high to low careful go your true altitude is decreasing guys this is vitally important for the exams but also for practical flying purposes now the opposite of this will happen when you're flying from a low pressure area to a higher pressure area your true altitude will increase so it would be as if you're flying from the right hand side of the screen to the left hand side of the screen you would be flying like uphill right your true altitude would be increasing then let's have a look at the temperature error. So that was the pressure error. You could see a difference in pressure there. So temperature error, this is when the indicated altitude and the true altitude differs due to non-standard temperatures. So let's see. In the middle, once again, we have our ISA block. We know that over there, our outside air temperature is equal to ISA. So therefore, the altimeter is reading correctly. On the left-hand side, we have it colder than ISA. You can see all the pressures of these uh, blocks of air are now the same, 1013. So it's only the temperature that is now different um, on the left-hand side and the right-hand side. So on the left, it's a colder block than ISA. So in this case, the altimeter is going to overheat, which is obviously very dangerous. And that is when your outside air temperature is colder than ISA. And on the right-hand side, our outside air temperature is hotter than ISA. And therefore, the altimeter is going to underread. Why is it underreading? Just look at your indicated altitude on the left-hand side of the block. It's 10,000 feet, but your true altitude is 12,000 feet. So when flying from an area of high temperature, so a hot area, to an area of lower temperature, a cold area, true altitude will decrease and vice versa. So therefore we have the saying, hot to cold, don't be bold. So meaning when you fly from a hot to a cold area, be careful, your true altitude is decreasing. The same as with high to low, careful go. So these are the two sayings, high to low, careful go, hot to cold, don't be bold. And both of them mean that your true altitude is busy decreasing. So let's have a look at the temperature issue. There we are. Let's say we're on a block of air, which is 25 degrees Celsius. Our pressure is 1013. Indicated altitude 10,000 feet. And let's just say for argument's sake, our true altitude is 10,000 feet as well. So our true and indicated altitude is exactly the same. So the altimeter is not lying. Now we're flying to an area which has got exactly the same pressure setting. The pressure doesn't change. It's 1013 at sea level. Okay. However, this block of air is only 10 degrees Celsius. Okay, so we're flying from 25 degrees Celsius to 10 degrees Celsius. Obviously, in the 10 degrees Celsius block, molecules are closer, air is more dense, so therefore, the vertical extent of that air is less. And what does the altimeter want to do? It just wants the eight air molecules below it because you've set 1013 on the subscale. So it wants to keep that eight air molecules below it and it indicates that we're at 10,000 feet. However, you can clearly see there that our true altitude is lower, right? It's at 8,000 feet. So our true altitude is less than our indicated altitude, the same as what we had with the high pressure and the low pressure, and that is the flight path that we have followed. So in this case, you can see we have flown from hot to cold, and therefore we say don't be bold, because without you knowing it, you're actually busy descending. So remember, hot to cold, don't be bold. Very important. So let's quickly have a look at a summary. Overreading, when is the altimeter overreading? Overreading is when the altimeter overreads your altitude. So your indicated altitude is higher than your true altitude. And this is dangerous and happens in colder air than ISA and higher pressures than ISA. That's when it's overreading. Underreading, underreading is when the altimeter underreads the altitude. So indicated altitude is lower than your true altitude. And this is not dangerous and happens in warmer air than ISA and lower pressures than ISA. Okay, important guys. Then high to low, if you fly from a high to a low pressure. When flying from a high to low pressure, be careful because your true altitude is decreasing and this is dangerous. So high to low, careful go. And then obviously a hot to cold. When flying from a hot area to a cold area, be careful because your true altitude once again is decreasing and this is dangerous. So hot to cold, don't be bold. So if you can remember those two, high to low, careful go, hot to cold, don't be bold. And you remember that in both these cases, your true altitude is decreasing. That'll help you to be able to do the reverse of that because it's just the opposite. Exam examples. Which of the following conditions would cause the altimeter to indicate a lower altitude than actually flown? They'll obviously give you a list of conditions. One of them would be, or the correct one would be that when the air temperature is higher than standard. Why? Because you can see the altimeter is indicating a lower altitude than actually flown. 
So your indicated altitude is lower than what you're actually flying, and that is in warmer than ISA air. Then let's move on to pressure altitude. So what is pressure altitude? Pressure altitude is the altitude or height of the aircraft above the 1013 hectopascal pressure line. So it's essentially the flight levels, right? We talk about flight levels as pressure altitude. It's basically the same thing. So we fly pressure altitude when we have Q and E set on the altimeter, and it's also called flight levels. That's pressure altitude. However, performance-wise, this is important. Pressure altitude will give us an indication of the performance of the aircraft. The higher the pressure altitude becomes, the poorer the aircraft performs and vice versa. So that's why we use pressure altitude as an indication of the performance that we can expect with the aircraft on that specific day at that specific location. And you will see if you use the graphs of the aeroplane to determine what your takeoff distance is going to be, they ask you one of the columns in the table or on the graph is to actually calculate your pressure altitude because the higher the pressure is, the more dense the air is, and the better the aircraft performs. The lower the pressure is, the less dense the air is, and the weaker the aircraft performance becomes, or the poorer. So that is why pressure altitude is important. Now we need to be able to calculate this, guys. So in the exam, you might get asked to calculate the pressure altitude with conditions given in the exam question. So let's look at an example. So it will say, airfield elevation is 2,500 foot. The Q and H is 1,020 hectopascals. What is the pressure altitude? They give you elevation and they give you the Q and H. Q and H, remember, is sea level pressure. So what do we do? First things first. Picture, picture, picture. Please don't try and do this without a picture. Draw your Z picture. Put in your Q and H there at sea level because that's the pressure at sea level, 1,020. And put in your elevation there of 2,500 foot. The next thing we need to do is remember we're calculating pressure altitude. So we need to think, okay, relative to my sea level, where is my 1013 line? And you can clearly see that if the sea level pressure is 1020, then my 1013 line will be above that, right? Because 1013 is a lower pressure than 1020. So that would be my 1013 line over there. That is my pressure altitude line. So for me to go and determine pressure altitude, all I have to figure out is just what is the altitude or the aerodrome elevation above that 1013 line. That's literally all you have to do. If you calculate pressure altitude, just think of it that way. How high is the aircraft above the 1013 line? That's it. So how do we calculate that? Well, we have two options here now. You can see we have our 1020 sea level pressure and then the 1013 hectopascal line over there. And we know the difference between these two, right? So we have... 7 hectopascals, how did we get that? Because it's 1020 minus 1013. So that gives us 7 hectopascals times that by 27 feet because 1 hectopascal is 27 feet. And then we get 189 feet difference between the red line and sea level. So in other words, we know that from sea level to the aerodrome is 2500 feet. So if it is from sea level to the red dotted line 189 feet, then we go 2500 minus 189 and that gives us 2,311 feet. And that is our pressure altitude, 2,311 feet. That is the height of the aircraft above the 1013 line. Now, our pressure altitude is thus 2,311 feet. You may need to use 30 feet instead of 27 feet in the exam if you don't get close to the correct answer. So let me show you quickly. There I'll use 30 feet in the calculation so you can see 7 hectopascals times 30 feet. That gives us 210 feet, and there we go, 2,500 minus 210. That will give you 2,290 feet pressure altitude. Now, obviously, guys, you need to understand what does this tell you. Like, okay, we've calculated pressure altitude 2,290 feet, but what the hell, what does it mean? Whoops, sorry, I need to go one back. So 2,290 just means that the pressure altitude that the aircraft is operating from is 2,290 feet. So you can see... The aerodrome is actually 2,500 feet above sea. However, the aircraft is operating as, the performance of the aeroplane would be as if it's flying from 2,290 feet. Why? Because of the high pressure at sea. Look there, the pressure at sea is 1,020, right? So because we have a nice high pressure at sea, the aircraft is performing better, and that's why we'll get performance as if we're flying from 2,290 feet instead of 2,500 feet. Okay, then airfield elevation, another question, is 2,500 feet. 
QNH 1005 hectopascals, what is the pressure altitude? So I'm going to throw it around a little bit now. So there we draw the same picture. You can see exactly the same. However, our pressure at sea level is 1005 hectopascals, not 1020. So now we need to ask ourselves again, okay, where is the 1013 line? Okay, and it's going to be below it because 1013 is a higher pressure than 1005. So it can't be above sea level. It must be below sea level, right? So what do we have to calculate? For pressure altitude, we need to know how high is the aerodrome or the aircraft above that 1013 hectopascal line. So if we want to get that, well, we get the difference between sea level and the 1013 line. That is 8 hectopascals times that by 30 gives us 240 feet. Now remember, don't just be, you know, in the rhythm of just subtracting the 240 from the 2500. You can see the a green arrow is now longer, right? So from the red line to where our aircraft is, is now going to be a higher altitude or elevation than the 2,500. So we go 2,500 plus the 240 feet that we've calculated. So now our pressure altitude is 2,740 feet. So now you can see it's the opposite, right? So because of the low pressure we have at sea, which is 1,005, it's as if we're operating from an altitude of 2,740 feet, although the aerodrome is only 2,500 feet above sea. So if the sea level pressure, the QNH, is higher than ISA, so higher than 1,013, then your pressure altitude is lower than your elevation and vice versa. You've just seen that. If your QNH is the same as ISA, so if our QNH at sea level was 1,013, then obviously our pressure altitude and our elevation will be the same because then your red dotted line will lie on sea level. So you'll basically just calculate your pressure altitude from sea level and that is the elevation. So then they are the same. So very important, the lower the pressure altitude, the better the aircraft performance will be and vice versa. As an example for, for the uh, exam, aerodrome elevation 4,600 feet, altimeter setting is 1,000 hectopascals. What is the pressure altitude? And they will tell you use one hectopascal equals 30 feet. And guys, you can go and do this one. You should get an answer. 4,990 feet. You must be at least within 10 feet from that to get the right answer. But if you use one hectopascal as 30 feet, you should get it spot on. Then 1013 hectopascal is set on the altimeter subscale and the aircraft is on the ground. What will the altimeter indicate? Just think about it. You've set 1013 on the subscale. You're telling the altimeter, read my altitude above the 1013 pressure line. So it's going to indicate pressure altitude to you or flight level. It's the same thing. So that was pressure altitude. Now let's move to density altitude. So what is density altitude? Density altitude is the pressure altitude corrected for non-standard temperature. So we've just seen that a change in pressure at sea level plays a role in the performance of aeroplanes. However, density altitude shows us that temperature plays a massive role also in the performance of aeroplanes. So it's the pressure altitude corrected for non-standard temperature at sea. So remember that pressure, uh, sorry, temperature changes the density of the air. So by calculating pressure altitude, we see the effect of pressure on our performance, but we need density altitude to see the effect of temperature on our performance. That's important. So performance wise, temperature has a bigger effect than pressure. So one change, uh, a degree Celsius change in temperature is going to have a much bigger effect than one hectopascal change in pressure. So temperature plays a massive role. So for every degree Celsius that the temperature is above ISA temperature, so every one degree Celsius that it's hotter than ISA, we need to add 120 feet to our pressure altitude. That's how big it is. Remember, one hectopascal is 27 feet, but one degree Celsius is 120 feet. So it's almost six times as temperature has a six times stronger impact on density than what pressure has. So high temperatures, guys, is very bad for performance. You want to stay far away from high temperatures. So a calculation in the exam, you might get asked to calculate the density altitude with the conditions given in the question. So let's look at an example. Airfield elevation, 2,500 foot. QNH is 1,005 hectopascals. That probably looks familiar to you. We've just done that in pressure altitude. And then the only thing they add, they have to give you this, is your outside air temperature, OAT. And in this case, they said it's 30 degrees Celsius. Then they ask, what is the density altitude? So what do you do? The first thing you do is to always calculate your pressure altitude. 
you cannot determine density altitude without your pressure altitude. That's always the first step. So, like I've said, please draw your picture. So in that case, you can see we had an elevation in the question. We had an elevation of 2,500 foot. Our Q and H was 1,005 hectopascals. That's at sea level. Okay. And then we calculated our pressure altitude there as 2,740 feet. Okay. Now from there, we need to start calculating our density altitude. And for that, we just use a formula. So we know that they've said that our outside air temperature is 30 degrees Celsius. Okay. So our density altitude formula is density altitude equals pressure altitude plus or minus bracket 120 times ISA deviation. Why 120 times ISA deviation? Because for every one degree Celsius that it's hotter than ISA, we need to add 120 feet. Or for every one degree Celsius that it is colder than ISA, we need to subtract 120 feet. That's why it's 120 times the total ISA deviation. So that is the formula that we're going to use. Now, what do we have? Density altitude we're looking for equals pressure altitude we've just calculated. That's 2740. Okay, so you need to draw a picture for that. Calculate it from the picture. And then plus or minus, we don't know yet. I'll tell you about that just now. And then 120 times the ISA deviation. Now, the first thing we need to calculate, guys, is the ISA deviation. We need to go and check by how much is the temperature deviating from ISA. Because it's 30 degrees Celsius outside, but what does ISA say must it be? So our ISA deviation, we take our pressure altitude, 2740. Divide that by 1,000, times it by 2. Why do we do that? Because for every 1,000 feet, the temperature must decrease by 2 degrees Celsius, according to ISA. Okay, we know it's really uh, 1.98 degrees Celsius, but we can round it up to 2. That gives you 5.5 degrees Celsius. Now remember, that is not the temperature that it must be at our pressure altitude of 2740 feet. That is only the lapse rate. In other words, that is by how much the temperature should decrease over 2740 feet. So it must decrease by a total of 5.5 degrees Celsius. Now the next thing you need to remember is what does ISA say must it be at sea level? So ISA says at sea level it must be 15 degrees Celsius. So then we go from sea level it's 15 degrees Celsius minus our 5.5 degrees Celsius and that gives us 9.5 degrees Celsius. So that means at our pressure altitude of 2740 feet we are supposed to have a temperature of 9.5 degrees Celsius. However, what is the temperature? It's freaking 30 degrees Celsius outside. So 30 degrees Celsius minus the 9.5 degrees Celsius is now going to give us 20.5 degrees Celsius. So you can see it's 20.5 degrees Celsius hotter than what ISA says it should be. Guys, that's massive. So what do we do now? We go back to our formula and we say density altitude equals 2740, which is our pressure altitude, and then we plus why do we plus and not minus? Because it is hotter than ISA. So whenever it's hotter than ISA, we add that ISA deviation times 120 feet. Whenever it is colder than ISA, you can subtract the deviation. Okay, because then our density altitude needs to decrease. So 2740 plus bracket 120 times the 20.5, which was our ISA deviation, the temperature deviation. And then that in total is going to give you 5,200 feet. So look there what happened just because of temperature that is 20.5 degrees hotter than ISA. So you can see there, the airport that the little aeroplane is taking off from is actually only 2,500 feet above sea level. But because of the temperature and the pressure that we have, especially the temperature, it's as if we are operating from 5,200 feet. It's more than double. So in other words, the aeroplane will perform as if it's not taking off from 5,200 feet and not from 2,500 feet. That is the effect that density altitude has. So as you can see, our aircraft performance will be as if we're flying from 5,200 feet instead of 2,500 feet, and that's a massive difference. So you've got to be careful. Now let's quickly have a look at a, a question of exam examples. Airfield elevation, 2,500 feet, QNH 1005. Outside air temperatures, 5 degrees Celsius. What is the density altitude? Now let me show you. We have the same pressure altitude, right? Nothing changed there. I've only changed the outside air temperature to 5 degrees Celsius. You can see at the top there's 5 degrees Celsius where the airplane is. So we do the same thing. Same formula. Density altitude, pressure altitude, plus minus 120 times ISA deviation. We have our pressure altitude 2740. Let's go calculate our ISA deviation. So once again, 2740 divided by 1000 times 2, that gives us 5.5 degrees Celsius. 
And then our ISA deviation, 15 minus 5.5 degrees Celsius is going to give us 9.5. That's what ISA says it should be at our pressure altitude of 2740 feet. However, it is 5 degrees Celsius and not 9.5. So 5 minus 9.5 means it's 4.5 degrees Celsius colder than what ISA says it should be. Okay, so that's good for us. Back to the density altitude formula, we go 2740. Now we minus, because it's colder than ISA, minus 120 times 4.5. And then we get a density altitude of 2200 foot. Okay, so you can see how good temperature can also be for us. Because although we're operating from an airstrip that is 2,500 foot above sea level in elevation, the aircraft is going to perform as if it's flying from 2,200 foot elevation. Okay. So as you can see, our aircraft performance will be as if we're flying from 2,300 foot instead of 2,500 foot. So we can expect an increase in performance due to the cold temperatures outside. When the temperature is standard, so if the temperature was ISA, I think it was, what, 9.5. So if our outside air temperature was 9.5, then your pressure and your density altitude will be the same. Because remember, density altitude is only your pressure altitude changed for non-standard temperature or adjusted for non-standard temperature. So if the temperature is standard, then your pressure altitude and your density altitude is exactly the same. You don't have anything there in those brackets. The 120 times ISA deviation, that will become 120 times zero. So that means you add nothing to your pressure altitude. Then a few exam examples. Under what conditions is pressure altitude and density altitude the same value? That will be at standard temperature, like we've just discussed. Under which condition will pressure altitude be equal to true altitude? That will be when standard atmospheric conditions exist. So that's when you have standard ISA conditions. That's when your pressure altitude will be equal to your true altitude. Then density altitude is what? Derived by correcting the pressure altitude for temperature. That will be one of the options in the in the question. Then airfield elevation, 1090 feet, QNH 1016 hectopascals. Temperature is plus 12 degrees Celsius. The density altitude is, I want you to go and calculate that. You'll see you get 880 feet. So go and draw a little picture, use the formula, practice a bit, and you should get to 880 feet. So guys, that's it from my side. Thanks for watching this video, and then we'll see you in the next one.